This is a weird thought, but imagine playing Double Dragon 3, the arcade version no less, then being prompted to plunk more quarters in to purchase items and or weapons from the in-game shop, to help you fight mummies slash aliens, and then thinking to yourself, man, this would make for a hell of a film. Well, that's just what happened with the first of 1994's video game to movie misfires, Double Dragon, which took the rough and gritty Fist of the North Star influenced beat em up and turned it into uh, this. And that. And who could forget? Oh, okay, that's that's enough. Stop stop running clips, please. I'm your host, Matt and Muscles, and you've wandered onto the set of What Happened, the show that pontificates and educates on the various developmental dregs of the video game and movie world. And much like several episodes that we've done in the past, today we're once again mushing together both mediums via the shockingly, but not really shockingly, long list of adaptations that should not have been. As I alluded to before, someone happened to be playing Double Dragon 3 in a Los Angeles arcade circa 1992, and that someone happened to be Don Murphy, an up-and-coming producer who was looking for projects to bolster his own Imperial pictures, and felt Double Dragon's lore would be suitable for the process of dramatization. It's somewhere between like Star Wars and Raiders of the Lost Ark meets the Teenage Ninja Turtles. It's something like an adventure, action, comedy, a little bit of everything kind of movie. What Don may not have known was that the Lee brothers' best days were passing them by in 1992 and were certainly behind them by 1994. Double Dragon 1 and 2 were absolute blockbusters, seeing literal thousands of ports and interpretations across a multitude of systems, and really setting the template for the brawler genre. However, Technos, the owner of the franchise, was notorious for licensing out the property to anyone with a pulse, and cared not for even a semblance of quality control, which is why you saw things like this. No one knows anything about this Komodo dragon dude. That's it. I can't wait any longer. I'm gonna call upon my dragon to lead me to him. No. No, bro. And since Don Murphy had a pulse, he was able to option the movie rights with very little trouble from Technos. And this is where our story gets crazy. Had Paul Dini, yes, Batman the Animated Series creator Paul Dini, draft up the first script. Now, it's not publicly known what this script was about, but it's safe to assume it was 8,000 times better than what we got. For whatever reason, Don wanted another pass on said incredible script and turned to Michael Davis and Peter Gould to, uh, ruin it. Now, I can't imagine this was an easy task. Double Dragon stories vary wildly from game to game, console to console, with home ports drastically changing and adding additional story whenever they felt like it. Hell, Double Dragon 3 on the NES has nothing to do with the arcade version, aside from starring Bimmy and Jammy. Anyway, they settled on the idea of the film taking place in a post-apocalyptic Los Angeles, in the far-flung future of 2007. Once night falls, various cartoon gangs take over the city, and all crime is apparently legal? It's a little unclear, but once the sun rises, the city goes back to being quote-unquote normal once more. Man, what a, what a stupid premise. What else did these buffoons go on to do? Uh, writing Breaking Bad and co-creating slash producing Better Call Saul. Now is the time where I'll be moving on and talking about the director, one James Yukich, who up until that point had only helmed commercials and music videos, which I guess must have impressed someone on the production side. Upon reading the script, James somehow interpreted it as a kid's film and decided that it needed more one-liners and humor, and thus sought out stand-up comedian Mark Brazil to punch up the script, which is almost always code for making it worse and making it worse he did. All right, what else did this buffoon make? Oh, he, yeah, he created that 70s show. Why, why didn't I discipline you? Shut up and eat your cornflakes. <laughs> 
So, in contrast to what the producers of the film wanted it to be, a no-nonsense martial arts action film bursting with 90s neon, the director felt, this is a kids movie. This could be a great kids movie. However, you have to have one unified direction or it's not going to make sense. And we didn't really have a unified direction. I love those producers and I think they're all fantastic, but they each had their own vision and we couldn't agree on it. I blame myself a lot for not going and saying, hey, we gotta do it like this. I wish I had the experience and knowledge I do now back then. Aside from the tonal issues, one other slight problem that affected just about everything was that the actors, the director, and mostly everyone else weren't familiar with the games at all, as no one from Technos was ever on set at any point during production. Nope, never talked to any of them at all, said Jukic. The writers were never given an official synopsis from Technos either, so that's why aside from the Lee brothers, Marion, and Abobo, there's very little tying it to the games. And in the early 90s, every kid wanted to see the stuff they recognized from the games. This is because, as mentioned before, Technos didn't hold its own franchises in very high regard, according to Double Dragon creator Yoshihisa Kishimoto. Many different people worked on Double Dragon's look over the years, and Technos often outsourced the game design and other products to external companies, so there was no consistency to the branding or the quality. I personally find it unfortunate, but that's the way Technos handled its titles. And that's the way the Double Dragon film was handled as well. Since the game's story was so all over the place, instead of the big bad being Machine Gun Willie, Jimmy Lee, or the Shadow Boss, a new antagonist was created, Koga Shuko, who looks like this. Yes, that's Robert Patrick, fresh off his role as Mimetic Polyalloy in Terminator 2. Get out. Now, he was considered the film's biggest get, as one of the producers had been courting him for months. However, the script called for an actor of Asian descent for the villain role. I mean, his name was Koga Shuko, so some dialogue had to be rewritten to accommodate for this. In the finished film, Shuko delivers an elaborate speech about changing his own name to sound cooler slash more intimidating. Koga Shuko is an American male who believes he's a reincarnated Japanese warlord. This wasn't the first and certainly wasn't the last of Double Dragon's little hiccups during its production. Lacking experience, but not ambition, on the very first day of shooting, Yukich wanted to film a complex technical shot. In one single take, have the camera move from under to out of the water as a part of the film's river escape set piece. Now, maybe due to him overestimating the complexities of such a feat, Yukich barely got anything filmed on that first day due to the lengthy prep that the shot would take. The second day wasn't much better as an accident befell the original director of photography who many on the film were excited to work with. Please note the usage of the word original director of photography. While trying to get a shot with a steady cam, he lost his footing and took a tumble down a hill, injuring his back fairly severely. Still wanting to fulfill his obligations, they attempted to wheel him around on a gurney with a monitor to supervise filming until it was decided to just maybe let it go. He was replaced by another DP who, while competent, wasn't well versed with framing action scenes. And things only got worse from there. A union issue arose which shut down the entire shoot for a whole month, causing the production team to fall greatly behind schedule. During that same river scene, several explosions go off in an attempt to make the film feel exciting, but apparently not enough warnings were issued to the city of Cleveland to let locals know a movie was being filmed, and thus emergency services received over 200 calls from concerned citizens prompting an investigation to sort out the problem. During all of these snafus, the team decided to let off steam and take some time to check out the competition, the Super Mario Brothers movie, which you might remember from our episode about the Super Mario Brothers movie, which for the director at least inspired some confidence. At the time, we thought we could certainly do better than this, and I don't know that we did. Once filming had finally wrapped and post-production had concluded, Double Dragon received another mm 
punch to the gut. The MPAA had slapped it with a PG-13 rating, which would kinda hurt the demographic the film was ultimately after. Yukich had fashioned it to be more of a family-friendly martial arts adventure, and the tone of the marketing reflected that. You said it. In the 80s and 90s, the MPAA was far more strict, so despite there being no blood, no swearing, and having a light-hearted feel, younger fans wouldn't even be allowed to watch it. What a buzzkill! Yukich laments that the producers made no effort to edit it down, which he would have been happy to do if it meant they'd get a lower rating. There was really nothing in it that should have made it more than PG. That caused kids to not be able to go see the film. It's a kid's film! This might have, but probably wasn't the real reason why the Double Dragons only made $4.2 million worldwide on a budget of 7.8. Instead of blaming the fact it was PG-13, perhaps the 8% approval rating, which takes into account the reviews from 1994, plus Double Dragons declining relevance, were probably the more potent factors. The writers, Davis and Gould, were reportedly embarrassed upon seeing the film at the premiere, but have since come to acknowledge that everyone in the entertainment industry has at least one Double Dragon style dud on their resume. Yukich never directed a motion picture after, but when asked about the Lee Brothers first and only cinematic adventure a few years ago, he admitted, I very rarely ever think about the film at this point, for any number of reasons. I look at it now though, and I am way happier with it than I was then. It's not as bad as I remember it being. Despite the critical uppercutting and poor box office, facets of the movie actually made their way into the games, like the solid Neo Geo fighter called Double Dragon. It takes some very specific elements of the film, for some reason, like some live action imagery, as well as Billy and Jimmy being able to power up into Double Dragon God Double Dragons. To be honest though, 1994 was a rough year for the franchise in general, as Double Dragon 5 The Shadow Falls hit consoles a few months prior, along with the horrible slash incredible Saturday morning cartoon which always lives rent free in my head. <laughs> Settle down, I'm a dragon too. Much like the Street Fighter film, Double Dragon was looked down upon in the year of its release, and many years after. Another victim of the video game to movie curse, but just like Street Fighter, it proves if you want to be fondly remembered 20 years in the future, then be cheesy and shitty right now. And if you're lucky, you might be talked about on the next episode of What Happened. If you know of any other films or games that were not appreciated in their day, then jump kick and hair pull your way into the Flophouse VIP Patreon to nominate the subject of your choosing. See you next time and thanks for watching. <laughs>